Let's open our Bibles now to the first Corinthians, the first epistle of Paul to the Corinthians, chapter 15 and verse 55. This is a passage we read responsively at the beginning of today's worship. First Corinthians and chapter 15. I want to particularly focus on verse 15 and then explain that in the context of this passage. 1 Corinthians chapter 15 and verse 55, which says, O death, where is thy sting? O grave, where is thy victory? O death, where is thy sting? O grave, where is thy victory? Apostle Paul tones death and grave. He is feeling victorious, triumphant, jubilant in the face of death. Brethren, that is our share, even in this world. A fearless disposition. A freedom that causes us to shout victoriously in the face of our last enemy, the final enemy that we have to face, which is death. Death is no longer a master over Christian's life. If you were to consider Apostle Paul's teaching about death with relationship to Christians, you will come out with a shout, just as what you read. O oh, death, where is thy sting? You're not afraid of death. I have met some Christians who are so scared of death. Pastor, don't talk about death. There are sermons where I have described the experience of death. Then after that, they say, that was very eerie today. I don't know why they are so afraid. It is really ignorance of what Christ has achieved for us that leads some Christians to live in the fear of death. I understand our um, lack of ability to conceive all the things that one might experience and able to overcome during that particular moment of death. We are all afraid because we have never been there. We have seen others going through. We see the struggles they go through. And we know how the Bible sometimes explains the, the word death, like the valley of shadow of death. That doesn't sound very pleasant. And even here, it seemed to talk, uh, Paul seemed to say, death has sting, and we don't like to be victimized by the sting of death. And so, generally, there is a gloominess, a fear that pervades the heart of people, even in the church. And Paul warned them to be sure that death is not something they should fear. Now, the word death in the Bible has three dimensions. First, it refers to our spiritual separation from God due to sin. That's called spiritual death. We are all dead in our sins and trespasses. As Paul talks about in Ephesians chapter 2, the first two verses. We are all dead in trespasses. And so those who have not come to Christ and remain in their sin are spiritually dead. They have no power to respond to God or to relate to God. They are totally incapacitated by sin. 
And in our church, we call it total depravity. Man is incapable because he's dead in sin. He's not half dead. He's not semi-conscious. He's dead. Unless God, by his grace, quicken us. Our regeneration, our born-again experience is God raising us up. It is not man choosing to follow. Yes, man choose, but only because God chose him first and give him the grace to believe. And then we choose. It is God who saves us. Salvation is 100% of God, not partial. And so when God raises up from our deadness, we experience our first resurrection, spiritual resurrection. We are raised up with Christ from the deadness of sin. And so we live not unto sin, but servants of righteousness to God. Now the second aspect of death is second death, which in the book of Revelation is referring to the final condemnation of sinners into the lake of fire, which is called second death. All the unbelieving people, all the hypocrites who pretended to believe but never believed shall be cast into the lake of fire. Now these two concepts of death are very clear. But in 1 Corinthians 15, Paul is particularly addressing the third reality of death, which we are all aware of, which all of us, whether Christian or non-Christian, will face. That is our physical death. The end to our life on earth. We all have to face. Christians also will go through it. But we are given the special joy and jubilant reality of victory that Christ has achieved for us to enjoy even as we pass through the physical death. That only belongs to Christians. We can take our last breath if we are conscious when we die by this taunting slogan in our tongue. I hope I can say it when I'm dying. O oh, death, where is thy sting? O oh, grave, where is thy victory? And I look at my dear ones around my bed and say, Bury me, I shall rise again when my Lord returns. We must pray that we would die with a victorious note as Christians. It is true. Death will have pain. Death will bring us through a lot of Struggles in our body, which will affect our mind as well. But fear not. Listen to what Apostle Paul wrote in Romans chapter 6 verse 9. Listen, let me read it for you. Romans 6 9. Knowing that Christ being raised from the dead, dieth no more. Death hath no more dominion over him. Death has no more dominion over Christ. So if you belong to Christ, you know your Savior, your Redeemer, your Shepherd will help you to remember this. He cannot be defeated by death. Death cannot snatch you away from Him. He stands as the risen Lord on your behalf. Staring at death and declaring to death, you cannot have dominion over Christ. In other words, the risen Lord has defeated death and rendered it powerless to bring about 
the ultimate death, which is the second death in hell. Well, death is an enemy. He is a real enemy of man, particularly Christians. Even for Christians, death is a real, nasty, ugly, frightening thought. Isn't it? Why? Death is what broke our dominion that God gave at the creation over the earth. We were supposed to reign this world as kings. God said to Adam, have dominion over all things. But when sin and death came, death put an end to our reign. Every man, even though he tried to have dominion over things, he is afraid of death's dominion over himself. Correct or not? Hitler or Napoleon or the great kings who conquered, whether it's Alexander the Great or Nebuchadnezzar, they all feared their own death. They were reduced to victims by death that crept up their body. I have seen some powerful preachers, great men of God, dying. And I remember the last days of some of them. I don't know a lot of people, but a few I know who were very bold as preachers, wonderful pastors, comforted the dying in their times of ministry. But when they were going through the last days of their life on earth, there was a tinge of sadness, a struggle against death. One thing that I was very touched with while I visit late Reverend Dr. Timothy Toe, my teacher and a founding pastor of the Bible Presbyterian Churches in Singapore. Reverend Timothy Doe was a man whom I loved and respected, who cared for me in many ways. Whenever I have an opportunity to have a close fellowship with him, he would end that session with a prayer. Sometimes he talks to me on the phone, he will pray for me at the end. And I always rejoice in praying for me. But in his last days when I visited him, and I said, Reverend Tho, please pray. He looked at me, and with very feeble voice he said, Brother, you pray for me. It changed. He saw me as a person who came to minister to him in his weakness. And he said, Brother, you pray for me. I need your prayer. A mighty man, in my estimation, a man of great spiritual strength. And I think I probably need your prayers when I come close to my death. Because death has a way of overpowering us. And he will put a str struggle with us. He's not going to let us go so easy. He wants to break our dominion, which God gave to us over the experiences of this earth. Of course, it's more violent if you were to think about death. It breaks our love relationships in this world. It separates a man from his dear wife. It separates a father from his children, a mother from her children. It not unexpectedly interrupts relationships, isn't it? Leaving everybody confused, troubled, and full of sorrow. What a violent, cruel reality is this. Death. It disrupts families. Suddenly when death happens, the whole family is in disarray. Everything they hope for suddenly comes to a standstill. 
It causes great grief and loss to those who are dear to the dying one. Brethren, irrespective of all these chaotic circumstances that death would bring, the Bible teaches us to taunt death without fear. That's what I hope you learn today. Because Christ has rendered death powerless on our behalf. We no longer have to fear death. Though it will invade us. Though it will torment us. Though it will remind us we are nothing but mortal beings on this earth. Please read verse 53 and 54 that precedes our theme verse. Where Paul says, for this corruptible, referring to our dying body, must put on incorruption. And this mortal must put on immortality. So when this corruptible shall have put on incorruption. That's a certainty, right? This mortal will put on immortality as well. And so this corruptible shall have put on incorruption and this mortal shall have put on immortality. Now watch this. Then shall be brought to pass the saying that is written. God's word has spoken. It is written in the pages of the Holy Scriptures forever for Christians to read. What is it? Death is swallowed up in victory. Where is it written? In the book of Isaiah, chapter 25, verse 8, we read, He will swallow up death in victory, and the Lord God will wipe away Tears from off all faces and the rebuke of his people shall he take away from off all the earth. For the Lord hath spoken it. I like the way Apostle Paul reminded Christians about this verse in Isaiah chapter 25 and verse 8. He said in this manner, then shall be brought to pass the saying. Who says who made it a saying? Who made it a proverbial saying among God's people? The believers. This is not a saying in the world. You will not hear this in hospitals where people are dying. You will not see this being written in mortuaries and casket companies. It should be written in every Christian home. And in every church and in our heart. It must be a common saying. That which is written in the scripture. What is it? Death is swallowed up in victory. I wish I can go home and write this on my house's wall. The same house that I bought to live with my wife and children will be a place where we will die now or later. It is a place we prepare to die. It's not a place we prepare to live on and on and on and on and on and on. No. Everything about this life is incorruptible on this earth. I'm sorry, everything is corruptible on this earth. Only things that are in heaven, incorruptible and immortal. Maybe it's good to write on our cars. Death is swallowed up with victory. Because some of our cars are going to be our coffin. Yes or no? Oh yes. We don't know. It will not be written in MRTs and SBS buses. It will not be written in planes that you fly in. It, not, it will not be written in cruise ships. But it must be written in your mind. For God has said it. And recording the scriptures. Death is swallowed up in victory. Remember, when you think about death... You must think about what? Victory. 
Victory looms over death as far as Christians is concerned because God spoke and he has done what gives us victory through his son, the Lord Jesus Christ. So let it be always in our mind when we think about death. Victory, victory in my Lord Jesus Christ. Death leads you to a great victory you have never tasted yet. Would you like to do this one thing? To think of this victory every day you live, even when sickness and death would come and knocking, uh, knocking at the door. You know, when an athlete goes into the track to run his race, what is the greatest thing he is desiring? Victory, isn't it? He sees the podium. He takes a look at the podium and the stand, the first prize. You see the ladder, second place, third place, and the first place. I think if he's a real determined athlete going to run to win, not to just add another name in the competition, but he has trained to win, he will look at that podium and say, I want to stand there. Let's go. I'm going to end with... A grandstand there. Christians, you live to die. But that death is your final fight. You will win. You will win. You, you will not lose. Because the Lord who defeated death will be there. Death cannot conquer him. If you stand in Christ, if you walk with Christ by faith, your victory is certain. And yours is the slogan. That the Lord gives to you to say, O death, where is thy sting? Death is completely destroyed. Swallowed up in victory. It cannot do further harm. It has already brought many disarray and trouble into this world. But it cannot do any further harm to Christians. God's children are safe. Probably it's like a tornado that hits a village. And you see the devastation of it. But there are hope. There are people who gives you hope. They arise from the destruction. They build, they build their homes. But there is a greater, greater hope for Christians. This tornado of death may hit us. <laughs> we are sitting in a very, very strong building. Praise God. Can this be our graveyard today? Could that be possible? Have you ever thought about it? This is well-built building. According to the normal standards, I don't think this will collapse. But if the earth would shake, if things would move under our feet, this will collapse. And here we die. But we die with the knowledge, with that saying in our mind, Christ has defeated death, rose on the third day, it cannot anymore bring us to total disarray. Death is only a passage to the immortality God has prepared for us through Christ. You know, brethren, the resurrection of Christ is a serious business of the church. This is not an occasional story we should remember. In fact, God so graciously appointed that we meet on the first day of the week after the manner of Christ's resurrection. So we don't worship on the seventh day. We worship on the first day of the week. Because it's a resurrection day. Church must celebrate. Christ is a risen savior. Our final enemy is defeated. This is the only organization. This is the only institution on the face of the earth. That rejoices over death. Every week. Did you get that? First day of the week. So do, today I 
you know, our brethren has published something I wrote some time ago on the first, part, first page. You can read it later. Why we worship on the first day of the week? Because God wants Christians to remember Jesus resurrected. Death has no power over us. We come together not for this world alone. We come be for eternal realities to which we are called. We come unto heavenly Jerusalem, the city of God. We don't come to this place. When we are here, the Spirit of God lifts us up, our minds beyond this world, beyond this building, beyond this canopy over us. We are led to the presence, the throne room of God, where Christ is seated on the majesty on high. Our souls join Christ unto heavenly Jerusalem, as the writer of Hebrews said. We gather together. We go beyond our death and grave. And we anxiously, I mean eagerly, intently, think, look for the heaven. Whose maker is God. We look for that day. Abraham was promised the promised land with milk and honey. Flowing with milk and honey. But the Bible tells us in Hebrews chapter 11. He walked there looking for a city. God may give us houses, condominiums, or a church building, or whatever, for this life on earth. But we cannot get stuck there. We are lifted by the knowledge of who Christ is and what he is planning for us to think less of these things and more of our heavenly home. By the way, even this slogan, O oh death, where is your victory? O oh death, where is your sting? Is a quotation from the Old Testament. I don't know whether you know this. It's taken from Hosea chapter 13, verse 14. Let me read that whole verse for you. Hosea 13, 14. Where God says, I will ransom them from the power of the grave. I will redeem them from death. O oh, death, I will be thy plagues. O oh, grave, I will be thy destruction. Repentance shall be hid from mine eyes. This is the background of Paul's statement. He uses a metaphor that Hosea used in Hosea 13, 14 to taunt death. Let me ask you this question. Is death taunting you or you taunting death? Christians, are you listening to me? I hope you are not being taunted by death. It would be terrible if that's the case. If ever that happens, call the scriptures to your mind. Call the promises of God's word into your mind. That your sins are forgiven as you repented and put your trust in Christ. And you're risen from the deadness that sin has brought to this world. Now, let me explain this. Death has a sting. We all acknowledge. If Christ is not in our life, if he is outside of us, then death has a sting that will send you to hell because you die in your sin and your sins will be judged. Hell is fixed. But my brethren, on our behalf, Jesus took that sting of death on the cross. Like a determined bee, the sting of death was placed in Christ. What is the sting of death? Verse 56 says, the sting of death is what? Is sin. Sin 
is the sting of death. In other words, when you die, if your sin is forgiven, death has no sting. It is a powerless event to trouble you. But if sin is still there, then death has a lot to trouble you. Because you fear what would come. That's why he says in verse 56, The sting of death is sin, and the strength of sin is the law. Because the law of God is against those who sin. It is the law of God that declares that wages of sin is what? Death. And we know the entire world is in the grip of the sting of death because as Romans 5.12 says, Wherefore as by one man sin entered into the world and death by sin. But for Christians, the story changes through the second Adam, we have victory. So through one man sin entered into this world, death by sin, and death pass upon all men, for that all have sinned. That's what Romans 5.12 says. However, later on, we are told to rejoice in Romans chapter 5. For example, we are told in verse 17 of Romans, for by one man's offense, death reigned by one. Much more they which receive abundance of grace and of the gift of righteousness shall reign in life by one, Jesus Christ. So when death plagues mankind, those who are in Christ will have the spirit of victory in Christ. Even in this life, we can say to death, ha, death. Didn't my Lord and Savior took thy sting out? He took it on himself. And he went down the grave. For three days he was buried. And he rose again to tell us who are taunted by death, fear no more. I shall, I conquer death. And likewise in me, you shall rise again. That's our faith. You know, dear brethren, let me assure you, death cannot do very much with you if you have put your trust in Christ. If you walk in the confidence of Christ and all that he has done, death can only interrupt you for a short while. It can interrupt this earthly life and the things that you are doing right now. But it can only usher you into heaven. It cannot send you to lake of fire. Jesus will not allow you to be lost forever. It might interrupt your existence on earth. That's fine. After all, we are not supposed to be here for long. We are chosen to be with him forever. The sting of death is sin and our sins are forgiven for Christ's sake. As the scripture says in 1 John 2.12 I write unto you little children because your sins are forgiven you for his name's sake. You know God forgives our sin not because we deserve it. Listen to this. He forgives our sins for his name's sake. Praise God. Now let no Christian here think that God continue to forgive because he look at you and see you are really trying very hard to become righteous. Actually, when he looks from heaven, we, he sees that we still sin. We easily give into our sins. Into anger and jealousy and bitterness and unforgiveness and carnal thoughts. Oh, even Christians like Paul cry out, Oh, what a wretched man that I am. Like Isaiah, we cry, whoa, whoa, I'm a man of unclean lips. Nobody will be able to say, I killed the sting of death. Unless you look to Christ and see what he says. For my name's sake, 
for I am faithful and just. What I promise I would do, if you trust in me, I shall forgive all your sins. None of us are going to get to heaven because we perfectly lived our life. There is none. But because he perfectly kept his promise, having given his life to save us. And so, in Christ, sin is rendered powerless. And therefore, death has lost its sin, its sting, as Christ has dealt with our sins forever. How wonderful it is to remember again that the blood of Jesus, his son, cleanseth us from all sin. From all sin. You might have done a million sins or countless and you can't even remember them. And you dare not think of them. You dare not keep a list of it because they are scary. You know remembrance of sin does not make us feel good at all. It frightens us in the presence of God. So we rather have no memory of sin. Hope it all erased. Let it go. Let it go. Let it go. Don't fear. They has no power over you. Why do you consider something that is not worthwhile? Your sin is not worthwhile thinking of it. It's gone with Christ who died for us. He took it away from us. And so when we read the law of God, which reminds us of our sin and the condemnation that we were under once, we say, oh, blessed God, thank you for the law that not only tells me that I'm a sinner, but how gloriously I'm saved. That which I could not do through the obedience of the law because I'm an imperfect man. Christ has done for me. He lived a perfect life sacrificed himself on my behalf and put his righteousness upon me when I was called to his side to put my faith in him. Oh, I am cleansed. I am clothed in the righteousness of Christ, the unblemished Lamb of God. I stand in Christ, made righteous by his gracious atonement. I cannot be taunted by death. I will not yield my mind to the terror of death. Young men, please don't think you may live under 80 years old. Okay? You may have to bid goodbye before you reach 30. It is possible. Yes or no? As I said the other time, one of the things I tell the young couple who come with so much expectation to get ready for marriage I look at the girl and ask, are you ready to be a widow? Huh? What a question to ask. Are you ready to be a widow? Isn't it a real question? I want to ask all the little ones here, are you ready to be orphans? You can't even think about it. You get frightened. But that's reality. Often I pray to the Lord, Lord, I don't know how to minister to widows and orphans. It's a painful reality. I can say a few words of comfort from the scriptures and pray for them. And they're gone. They may plunge again into misery. And sometimes I'm so helpless when I stand by those who are grieving over the death of the dear one. I don't know how I can lift them. I just sing a song, sometimes read a portion of the scripture. Sometimes I go away thinking that I did nothing to help them. And I pray, Lord, your spirit work in them. But I just want to say to you, my dear friends, even when your pastor fails, you cannot fail because your Lord says to you, taunt death. Don't fear. Oh, death, where is thy sting? All the kids who are listening to me, can you say? Oh, death, where is thy sting? Your mummy and daddy may have to bury you before you bury them. And if your daddy and mummy cry at your deathbed, you must say, Mama, why do you cry? I trust the Lord. I'm going to Jesus' place. I'm going there to be with the Lord. 
Death has no power over me, mommy. I am going to a better world. It's a better world than this condominium, mommy. Even if daddy is going to buy me a bungalow, it cannot match what the Lord prepares for me. A place of glory. I will be with my Lord and you will come there. So don't worry. I hope our children are strengthened by God's word to bear such a testimony in those moments of gloom and sadness. And God be pleased to strengthen you with these words for things that we can't even predict. The untimely death that might come. The unexpected death that might come to taunt you, but you taunt him back in the name of Christ. Don't surrender to his threatenings. Don't be victimized by death. For Christ came to deliver you from the fear of death. By cancelling the power of sin. By bearing our condemnation on himself. Being our substitutionary sacrifice. Blessed be his name. So brethren, we shall then say, as we come to the end of this study, when death comes, aha, to depart, to depart from this world is what? To be present with the Lord. That's the joy of every Christian. Philippians chapter 1. Verses 23 and 24, where Paul gives this great testimony as he is waiting for his death in the prison. He is in prison. There's a prison episode, Philippians. And there he says, for I am in a strait betwixt two, having a desire to depart and to be with Christ, which is far better. Nevertheless, to abide in the flesh is more needful for you. <laughs> Sometimes we have this struggle. We think about a husband, we think about a wife, we think about our children, we think about the church, we think about our responsibilities. We like to stay for the benefit of the rest. Not because we don't want to leave, but in order to be a blessing and continue to help, we want to stay back, not to enjoy the sin of this world, but to be somehow a channel of blessing. So if you ever pray for lengthening of your life, remember, it's, as a Christian, it's only to serve Christ. And benefit the rest. Otherwise don't ask. For what? To commit more sin? To plunge into more wickedness? And add more misery to this world? If you ever desire to live a minute more. It should be to be a channel of God's blessing. But even then. Even if you think it's necessary. To stay on to help. Never mind. Remember this. If God calls you, God is a better husband to your wife than you yourself. God is a better father to your children than you yourself. You remember that? <laughs> Jesus said, ye which are evil know how to give good gifts to your children. How much more your heavenly father give good, give good gifts to those who pray to him, right? So we should face death no matter how Helpless we might feel and how terrible we might feel. With faith, confidence in the goodness of God to take care of the people whom we leave behind. And with assurance that I'm now departing to be present with the Lord. To be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. Where is the sting of death? Gone with Christ's death forever from us. It has no power over us. Read with me Hebrews chapter, 14, chapter 2, verses 14 and 15. Hebrews chapter 2, verses 14 and 15. Let's raise our voice and rejoice in God's word. Let's read. For as much then as the children are partakers of flesh and blood, he also himself likewise took part of the same, 
that through death he might destroy him that had the power of death that is the devil the deliver them or who through fear of death were all their lifetime subject to bondage jesus came and took flesh like to be like us because he wanted to represent the people who were kept under the torture and the tone of the devil who introduced sin to us and kept us in the in this fear of death because he knew as we committed sin we will be so frightened about god and his judgment and feel so helpless he wanted to victimize satan is no lover of our soul but as we sing jesus lover of my soul he came and became a man so that i may be delivered from the taunting of satan and sin and death forever and here we are told in verse 15 deliver them who through fear of death were all their lifetime subject to bondage i'm not sure whether you are a christian or not if you are not at assured of heaven if you have been taunted by death fear of death gripping you come to jesus today for he says look at me i died to destroy the sin and its guilt that was upon you i have died on your behalf i paid the price the penalty of your sin now by my death your condemnation is taken away now i rise again to show you even this physical death introduced by sin to this world will not have a grip on you just as i rose again on the third day you shall also rise again when i return trust in christ now fear of death will vanish like wax melt away in the heat of fire Christ let him shine let him take away the darkness and fear that grips your heart now trust him my friend don't wait any further trust him and those who have trusted Christ rejoice say it in your heart what o death where is thy sting can you say it looking at your own coffin <laughs> have you ever pictured that you in a coffin or oh, some people who fall dead they think about it i'm very very amazed how sometimes christians they say they are christians but the moment they see a coffin they will faint it's just just imagine all kinds of weird thing that you are going to be a ghost and roaming around and you're going to be stuck inside that come on don't believe all the ghost story you know they have this publication called singapore ghost story Don't touch that abominable thing. For what? Read the scriptures. Fill your mind with the knowledge of the scriptures. Fathers, talk to your kids about death. Don't be afraid, but speak of it in the light of Christ, who is the life and resurrection. Let your children be prepared for death, not for all levels. Not for entrance into NUS. but to entrance into heaven this is the most glorious slogan we have o oh death where is thy sting whether you sit for o level entrance o level exam or not everybody will go through this death for it is appointed unto man once to die prepare them for that the rest the lord will take care remember my brethren in christ our victory over death is sealed you know what in revelation chapter 20 which we have been studying every sunday we have already seen in chapter 20 verse 14 the bible says death and hell were cast into the lake of fire this is the second death and whosoever was not found written 
in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. So those who are not saved and the names are not written in the book of life must fear death and come to Christ for salvation. And again in chapter 21 of Revelation, verse 4, we read, God shall wipe away all tears from their eyes. This is about the believers. And there shall be no more death, neither sorrow, nor crying, neither shall be any more pain, for the former things are passed away. Death is a temporary visitor. He should not be allowed to taunt us. We taunt him through death. We enter the celestial glory that God prepared for us. Rise up, brethren. Let's sing, Christ is risen. <laughs>